Good afternoon and welcome to the 104th Sibley Lecture at the University of Georgia School of Law. Over 44 years ago, Yale Law Professor uh, Myers McDougall delivered the inaugural Sibley Lecture on Jurisprudence in a Free Society. Our Sibley Lecturers have since included judges, among them Earl Warren, Harry Blackman, Antonin Scalia, and Roger Trainer, famed academics such as Professor Charles Allen Wright, H.L.A. Hart, Grant Gilmore, Stanley Fish, more recently Akhil Amar, Gerald Gunther, and, and Pam Carlin, and public servants including former President Jimmy Carter and Solicitors General Rex Lee and Wade McCree. The Sibley Lecture Series is underwritten by the Loredans Foundation in Atlanta, now headed by Robert Edge, a senior partner in the law firm of Alston and Byrd. The Loredans Foundation has been a generous supporter of the law school and its educational program for many years. Since the establishment of the Sibley Lecture Series, the foundation has contributed well over one million dollars to our school. Quite obviously, we're extremely grateful for the foundation's support. Now, the Sibley Lecture honors the memory of John A. Sibley, a member of the law school's class of 1911, who was very prominent and successful in both law and banking. Among other professional accomplishments, he served as general counsel of Coca-Cola in the 1930s, chairman of the board of the Trust Company Bank, as, and a senior partner at the uh, law firm of King and Spaulding in Atlanta. Now, Mr. Sibley, whose portrait hangs here on the second floor of Hirsch Hall, was also influential, influential in issues affecting this law school. In the late 1920s, he played a pivotal role in the campaign that led to the construction of this building, Hirsch Hall. He also was an integral part of the effort to obtain full accreditation for the law school in the 1930s. And now we turn to the latest in a long line of distinguished Sibley lecturers, Vice Dean of Stanford Law School, Mark Kelman. Professor Kelman has taught us all in the Legal Academy a great deal about a great many and greatly varied things. As one of the pioneers of the critical legal studies movement and the man who literally wrote the book on the subject, Professor Kelman explored the contradictions in the liberal approach to law and the sources of indeterminacy in our law. He taught us more clearly to appreciate what the Coase theorem does and does not say. We learned from him why Richard Epstein's book on the takings doctrine was, quote, a work roughly comparable to some survivalist diatribe that we, know, that we owe no income tax so long as we're paid in fiat currency rather than gold-backed notes. Now, I should add uh, that Professor Kelman is an extremely kind man, and he also explained in that article why it was necessary to talk in such terms. Uh, we've also learned that what may seem like an easy, morally virtuous position against discrimination is, in fact, insufficiently specified. There's not one norm against discrimination, but he has taught us many, each subject to very different criticisms. More recently, Professor Kelman has contributed to the literature on law and behavioral science and on our, pra and on our practice of using notions of welfare to determine social policy. Of the many fields of law in which Professor Kelman has written, none has been left in quite or even nearly the same state in which it existed before he arrived on the scene. His teaching interests are as varied as his scholarly ones. Professor Kelman teaches courses such as criminal law, property, income distribution, race in the law, and anti-discrimination law. My own biggest regret from my law school days was that I only took Professor Kelman's property course. The impact of that experience on my thinking only increased over time, even before I began to teach property myself. It's safe to say that Professor Kelman is easily the best teacher I ever had in any subject and my most important legal mentor. Today, he will teach us all about the ways in which we value the lives of identifiable persons and those of unknown but statistically specified individuals. Without further ado, I present to you Professor Mark Kelman on Saving Lives, Saving from Death, Saving from Dying. Thanks, Kristen. Um, thank you all for coming here today and giving me opportunity, ooh, this is a little shaky, yeah. Giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, two issues with a pretty substantial academic and practical pedigree. Um, one of the issues is how to save, how to think about saving identifiable lives, people who are known, people who are named, uh, people who are easily described, and how to compare that to saving statistical lives, um, people who we know will die as a result of projects that we engage in, but we don't know who they are. And at the same time, a second issue, how to think about um, saving people who are already in peril rather than preventing people from developing fatal maladies or from dying. The two issues might at first blush seem like they are more or less the same issue. And in the kind of in the canonical cases that people have talked about, 
um, the two issues do end up playing out in much the same way. So the canonical cases are cases like, why do we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to rescue baby Jessica from the well um, and spend so little money on preventing similar accidents that jeopardize people or either other kinds of accidents that might prevent death. And in the baby Jessica kind of case, um, both the issues are the same, they cut in the same direction, because Jessica is both known and identifiable in, in all of the thickest senses of identifiability. We know her name, we know facts about her, um, you know, we, we can picture her. Um, and at the same time, she's already in peril. She, you know, she's already actually subject to, uh, to risk. But you can imagine that the two issues can be separated out from one another. We could choose to expend much more money to reduce the prospective risks that a known person would develop a fatal malady than we would spend to reduce the risks that an unknown person um, would develop such a malady. So, so that's just, you know, both risk. Neither person is in danger yet, but we might spend more on a known person. And flipping it around, um, we could spend a lot more money trying to cure diseases, not knowing who's going to be cured, than we spend on preventing the development of the same diseases that are going, that um, might otherwise have been cured. And in fact, not only are the issues theoretically distinguishable, I'm actually going to suggest today, to a certain degree, that the willingness to spend on saving those who are already in jeopardy, rather than to sort of prevent peril from developing, dominantly reflects distinct reactions that we have to death and to the dread of death. And that therefore it's a reaction that you can imagine having in relationship to your own life. It's a selfish reaction, try, just trying to be a completely selfish utility maximizer. You might differentiate what it is to spend on saving rather than preventing the development of peril. While I think, again, that's not my only reaction, but it's my dominant reaction. At the same time, I think our sympathy for identified over unidentified persons, again, without regard to the saving versus development of peril, arises predominantly from non-utilitarian or anti-utilitarian moral views that are of interest largely in thinking about our relations to others. So that again, on the first issue, I think um, the preference for saving, saving an already imperiled person over saving from the development of peril is both relevant to the way we treat others, but it's also relevant to the way we treat ourselves. Second issue, identifiability itself, the pure identifiability issue, I think is mostly an issue in relationship to others. I hope I'll demonstrate that to be a kind of convincing argument. Um, now, resolving these issues is plainly of some public policy moment. It matters for public policy formation. Resource allocation decisions are sensitive to how we resolve these questions. Simple version of that, you know, there are finite resources to be expended on what could be broadly called public health-like projects. They could be invested in the, at the margin in safer highways, or they could be invested in better emergency rooms that save more crash victims. Um, even in thinking about personal or private judgments, depending on how we conceive of the preference for identifiable over statistical lives, it may be that we privately overvalue the reduction of identifiable symptoms at the expense of accepting higher but unidentified diffuse risks of mortality and morbidity. And it may be for some of the same reasons that we overvalue identifiable lives over statistical lives. So again, I don't want to go into the medical debate over this, but you could argue, just to, just to sort of to clarify, um, under certain views of hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women, um, people are reducing immediately visible symptoms at the expense of taking on more morbidity and mortality in the future in a diffuse way. So, you know, the issues may be of tremendous practical importance. And I don't want to disclaim interest in the practical problems because the truth is I'm really interested in them. 
But the truth is also they are really um, befuddling to me. Even after you know, thinking about this a lot, I don't have easy answers for these issues. So what I'm hoping to do on the, on the practical side is to suggest some additional ways of thinking about the problems that will fall far short of resolving the policy problems. At the same time, I actually think the, this issue is a really fertile and useful issue to think about um, evaluating a number of dilemmas in public policy formation and private dis decision making that bring up disputes that occur not just here but in a number of areas about the appropriateness of consequentialist methodologies. And methodologies, consequentialist methodologies that I'm really quite drawn to in a lot of ways but also partly disdainful of it and, and thinking through the tr standard treatment of um, the disparity between identifiable and statistical lives and saving versus preventing death. I think I will reveal both a sympathy for a lot of traditional consequentialist reasoning and a kind of hesitation about it. Okay, so here's my more specific goal though. My more specific goal is to embrace in part and reject in part the mainstream intuition among fundamentally utilitarian public policy wonk, you know, public policy school types, law and economics types, that subjects who spend more or are willing to spend more to save an identifiable life than they would spend to prevent the death of an unidentified person, are, they are the poster children for the persistence of irrationality and error in the formation of public policy. They are, you know, they're it. They, they, you know, they put them in a little picture in the dictionary next to like, you know, welcome idiots, it's people who would do this. And they're ubiquitous. Um, where's the intuition come from? Well, it's the primary intuition of people who are schooled in the notion that a certain form of rational decision making is normative. That is to say, it's what we should do. But that actors frequently are cognitively incapable of making rational choices. And they're incapable of making rational choices not for the simple and obvious reason that sometimes they lack information about the expected effects of their choices, but because their internal processing capacities are um, inadequate to deal even with the information that they have available. So these are internal problems, not just external problems of information. So again, what's driving the, the view that these people who post their children for rationality is, irra you know, there is a form of rationality, we know what it is, and people sometimes just can't do it, and this is a case of a, a situation where people are just not doing it. So what lies a baby step behind that general intuition? Well, a baby step behind that general intuition is that we can impute with one little exception that I want to mention in a moment and then set aside for the whole rest of the of this lecture, that we can impute one sensible aim to actors in this setting, and that's a consequentialist commitment to minimize premature death. That's the only aim people can have. They're trying to, they should be trying to maximize life expectancy, either of an individual, if you're doing it in your own case, or of a collectivity, if you're doing it for the group. Now, here's what I want to set aside. It's important to set aside, but it really would take us, you know, in a, in a whole, it's a whole different lecture. I want to set aside morbidity um, and suffering. I want to set aside the fact that different deaths paths to death may be associated with different levels of pain or lack of functioning. Now, that, dispute comes out within the completely rational consequentialist community in thinking, let's say, about the distinction between increase, maximizing the number of years people live versus maximizing the number of quality adjusted life years that people live. That comes out in the Medicaid rationing area, comes out in medical ethics all the time. I actually want, I, it's not that that inter isn't interesting to me, but it's a big other question. So I'm, you know, my people, they just live or they die. There's, 
there's no sickness in my world. It's a pretty world in some ways. Well, I'm about to make, it's gonna be a psychologically ugly world, but it's a physically pretty world. So, the, so again, the baby step intuition, right, the baby step behind the intuition of people being irrational is there is one rational end, and that's maximize life expectancy. Um, so if increasing the number of years people, including ourselves, live, is the only rational goal to seek, then it follows pretty readily that actors could better meet this goal if they transferred an incremental dollar invested in a death decreasing project from a death decreasing project that saved fewer lives to one that saved more lives. That's not you know, a hard conclusion to get to. So if the subjects are not following this policy, subject must be making one of two forms of cognitive error. He must either misperceive the effects of his actions, perhaps by misperceiving the number of lives that will be saved taking each action because he has a distorted understanding of the probabilities that particular outcomes follow from particular actions. He's making mistakes about probabilities. Or, um, he treats identical outcomes as distinct because of the way the outcomes are named or framed or his preferences about the outcomes are elicited. So having said this, he's making a mistake about probability or he's making a mistake about the framing of outcomes. What you should hear for those of you who do this literature is this is just the standard core stuff of the heuristics and biases literature associated with the Nobel laureate Dan Kahneman and his late collaborator Amos Tversky with enormous influence in the law schools today and what's usually referred to as behavioral economics. So in that view, people do try and should try to compute something like the expected utilities of their choices, setting aside complicated things about risk preferences that differ between heuristics and biases, people and legal, sort of traditional law and economics people. But at core, for heuristics and biases people, people's normative goal and actual goal is to maximize expected utility, probability of an event times the value of the event that will occur. And where do they get messed up? They either miscompute probabilities or they get messed up evaluating the outcomes whose probabilities they either know or already miscomputed. And that's the basic stuff of the claim that we must be seeing irrationality in this context. Okay, so um, I'm really sympathetic to the heuristics and biases tradition. It's, you know, I gotta love it, it's how I got my job. You know, I have a good job and, you know, I started writing in this tradition more than 30 years ago. I was writing in it parallel to all the psychologists who were writing, it's how I got my job at Stanford, writing my third year paper on endowment effects before lawyers were writing about endowment effects. So, you know, I'm really, I, I, I both believe in it a lot and I'm personally invested in it in a kind of selfish way. But I've also spent a lot of my life being, um, trying to be aware of the standard problems within the heuristics and biases tradition. So what are the standard problems I want, which are the standard problems that I've tried to remain aware of what I like to deal with today in thinking about these issues? Well, the first problem is the one I'm probably gonna spend most of the time on during the rest of the lecture. Even if our subjects, the people we're considering who have this set of preferences, either they are or should be kind of simple, straightforward, consequentialists, um, it's possible that we're pr just really profoundly wrong when we say that they've failed to meet this single end that we've imputed to them. That we're wrong to miss the possibility that they're seeking either a completely alternative set of ends or seeking that end and some supplementary ends. So what I'll argue in this regard, and again, this is what I'm gonna come back to for most of the lecture, is that a rational subject may seek not only to minimize deaths, or to put it another way, to maximize either their own or collective life expectancy, but they also seek to alter how people die. 
And again, I want to reiterate, I don't mean to say that they want to alter how people die in the morbidity sense. I don't mean it in the physical pain sense. Um, I'm saying that they are trying to dampen certain aspects of the existential despair connected with dying rather than the quite distinct and under some theories not even obviously present well-being losses associated with death. Um, and so I'm, that's going to be the big theme. But I also want to notice, note and then come back to one of these sub-themes a little bit. I wanted to note um, that it's also possible that we're wrong to see the subjects we're discussing either as bumbling consequentialists, you know, just like doing the best they can but dropping the ball in the sun, that they're neither necessarily bumbling consequentialists nor even consequentialists who have a richer, thicker, longer list of preferences than we first thought. They may be non-consequentialists or anti-consequentialists in three distinct fashions. Again, I'm going to be talking about this less in the remainder of the lecture, but I did want to highlight all these points. First, they may be non-consequentialists because their moral decisional code is agent relative rather than agent neutral in the sense that they are interested in what they as individuals do not just in the results that arguably necessarily are the necessary causal outcomes of all of their course of acts and omissions. So think in this regard about the kind of the standard, if obviously hardly uncontroversial, deontological, deontological intuition that an actor could, could not justly punish an innocent person V to save another set of innocent victims X, Y, and Z from a mob that would be satiated by V's punishment because A's conduct is rights violating. It's sort of just a standard agent relative deontological position. Um, it's plausible, and again, we're not going to come back to this much, but I wanted to raise the possibility. Um, it's plausible to me that those who seek to save identifiable lives are parallel to, though not exactly like, those who believe that their duties to avoid harming are considerably more extensive than their duties to save. So if the failure to take precautions to decrease global risk is most like failing to act, and killing a person is most like rights violating action, it's perhaps the case that failing to take steps to save already identifiable persons occupies a moral middle point between those two. As I said, I'm not going to discuss this point a lot further today, but I do want to make a note because it's going to contrast with my second point on agent relativity. I think there's something to that, but I've got to just note that I'm not a big fan of that kind of agent relative argument. I, think in a variety of ways that I'm not going to discuss that I'm skeptical that this particular form of agent relativity is morally justifiable. And on this issue, though not on a lot of other issues, I actually think Cass Sunstein's work on moral heuristics is correct in two ways. One, that the act-omission distinction that we draw is a useful generalization with lots of evolutionary roots, but little moral force. Um, it's right in most settings, but it's not really a principle. So that's one point. The second point that Sunstein raises, again, which I agree with, is that whatever one makes of the act omission distinction and talking about one's own conduct, it's not a very sensible way of thinking about collective action. It's very difficult to know how to characterize polities as either acting or not acting when they choose policy. So, but I do think there's, it, in a fuller version of this, I would want to discuss more the possibility that part of what's at stake is that people are agent relative in the sense that they are concerned about their conduct, not just the results of their life, you know, their life work. Um, our decision makers might also be non-consequentialists in a second sense. Um, and this one I will come back to a tiny bit at the very, very end of the lecture. Um, they might make judgments that are agent relative in the sense that they see no compelling reason to treat all deaths as equally bad, even if they accept the abstract moral equality of those who will die, um, because they are entitled to demonstrate partiality and preference 
for some set of persons who might die. So again, think about the standard, just as we thought about the standard case on the other form of agent relative deontology being not punishing the innocent to, to you know, fight off the mob. The standard deontological case in this regard is like I'm a dad and I have kids and uh, there's been a boat accident. Can I save my kid when if I, you know, let one of my kids, they're, they're grown, if they're more likely to need to save me. But imagine them as being smaller kids. Um, can I save my kid rather than save two other children who I believe are equally ensouled, equally morally worthy? But am I entitled to express partiality, you know, grounded in the relationship? And, um, you know, so again, that's sort of a, a standard case. Um, it's obvious that as compared to the relationship with friends or kin that we may have, the relationship, the thin relationship we, we develop with identifiable rather than non-identifiable persons is not that powerful, but it may be that we establish non-trivial relationships with those we know are dying merely by virtue of knowing their identity and that those relationships justify um, justify at least a weak form of partiality. So at the end of the lecture, I do want to come back a little bit to considering whether the preference for prolonging the life of identifiable persons separate out as much as possible from the question of whether they're already in jeopardy or not already in jeopardy can be understood in significant part by reference to this second form of agent relativity, what I was referring to more as a moral view. And I also want to comment briefly on whether we should foster this seeming consequentialist error if, and perhaps only if, it serves consequentialist ends to do so. You know, so a standard argument on the child case that I drew before is, um, it may be good for me to want, it may be good to nurture the close relations between parents and children for consequentialist ends, and that's why it's okay for me not to be a consequentialist on the particular occasion. It's one of many forms of rural utilitarian arguments against kind of localized utilitarianism. Okay, so um, there's a third argument that I really want to barely touch on, and, but again wanted to mention. It's also possible that um, people who are making what the classic policy wonks think is a an error in, in working through consequentialism are, like all people, simply incapable of um, engaging in consequentialist reasoning at all. I mean, there's a long tradition that's sort of, of cognitive science that sort of says this whole idea that we can, can are capable as people of making decisions by toting up expected utilities and then picking the best outcome is a bad way of thinking about cognition. So a whole variety of theories that in philosophy get described as incommensurability theories, in cognitive psychology get described as kind of domain-specific cognition theories, all tend to push us in the direction of saying that it's perfectly plausible that the reactions our subjects have to each of these distinct death-causing scenes are processed completely separately. They each are cues in the environment that cue appropriate human responses not mediated in any way by the gains or losses of each response. They're simply cued responses to delimited external stimuli. And that our goal in thinking about cognition in a world in which multiple cues seem to cue incompatible action. This is the incommensurability problem. You know, how do you, you know, how do you, when you're two things cue doing things that you can't do both of them at once. But within this cognitive tradition, our goal as whether cognitive scientists or lawyers trying to integrate cognitive science is to figure out at the kind of um, neurobiological level um, how it is that we process cues that seem to direct us in incompatible directions, but that it, whatever it is, it's not by picking the best outcome, that this is just the wrong way of thinking about that. But that's an issue I'm probably not going to return to at all. So let me start with the big issue um, now, which is this possibility that our subjects are at core um, mis- 
specifying their, um, that we are specifying the goals our subjects have, that we think we understand that they have a single goal, which is maximize life expectancy, but that's not really their goal. Now to get to this, I want to distinguish two distinct sorts of arguments that are suspicious of the heuristics and biases approach um, when heuristics and biases researchers try to demonstrate experimentally that subjects are <clears throat> unable to meet their considered ends because of cognitive distortions. Um, the second of these two is the one that I'm actually going to be more drawn to dealing with today. Okay, so those are who take the first approach. Um, it's associated with Gerd Gigerenzer and what's usually referred to as the fast and frugal heuristic school and its critiques of Kahneman Tversky's uh, heuristics and biases school, argue that subjects are not consciously rational. So it has something to do with this domain-specific stuff that I was just talking about a moment ago. Um, instead, people use um, non-rational judgments and decision-making tools that take advantage of readily available information in natural environments to make behavioral decisions that meet organisms' proximate goals. The decisions are not conventional rat choice, you know, logical decisions, and they're not they're not meeting conscious goals that the heuristics and biases people just missed. They're just not rational decisions. They just meet the organism's ends. And they're rational in that sense, which they describe as ecological rather than logical rationality. The second approach, the one I want to talk a little bit more about today, is more associated with um, economists and rational choice theorists' criticisms of heuristics and biases research. Um, and that is that subjects who seemingly fail to meet the ends ascribed to them by experimenters are actually consciously meeting a separate end. So let me give it to, to illustrate the distinction between the giga renter fast and frugal critique and the rat choice critique. I'll give an example. So there's a set of experimental findings that um, heuristics and biases people have worked on a lot on something that's usually referred to as probability matching. So Here's a basic set of experiments. So we put a, like an urn with seven red balls and three green balls in the urn. And we say we're going to draw a ball of time and then put it back in. So it's done with replacement. So the odds are always 70% red, 30% green. And we tell people, you will win you know, $10 each time you guess right. You'll get 10 guesses one at a time, you know, and you win $10 for each correct guess. Now, if you're trying to maximize expected value, you should choose red all 10 times. And in fact, people virtually all pick red seven and green three. They match, they, it, probability matching. They, they, their guesses match the most likely aggregate result for the, for the whole sample, which is not the rational thing to do on a one-by-one -one basis. So the standard response of the kind that I'm talking about, they, they have more ends than you think, by rational choice theorists is, their utility function isn't as simple as you think. They're not trying just to maximize the amount of money they are. They're trying to stay interested. Their utility function includes not being bored by the game. And if you just guess red 10 times, it's a boring game. So thinking you're like, I think, I, I think I've got it. It's going to be a green this time. It's going to be red this time. That keeps this game interesting. And since the stakes are pretty low, um, it's not surprising that people have this supplementary goal. And that's kind of the kind of critique I'm going to be talking about. But just to illustrate what the fast and frugal critique would be, it's that we developed views about probability matching as evolutionarily evolved strategies for dealing with the optimal foraging problem. If any of you want to ask later how they got to that, I, I can tell you it's, it's a bit of a stretch, like a lot of evolutionary psychology stories. But at any rate, the point of the optimal foraging story that you should search the, the, you know, the berry place less likely to have berries 30% of the time and the one more likely to have berries 70% of the time isn't grounded in the idea that that maximizes any conscious goal or expected value. It is simply a de an evolved, developed strategy that meets your chances of bearing children and having them grow up to be reproduce themselves better than any other strategy. It's not 
in, and the, we just mimic it in the green and red urn case because that's how we've learned to solve such problems. It's not that in either situation you have some rational choice and, and you know, there might be more ends than we thought or fewer ends. It's like you're not trying to meet ends. So, so that's the way in which the critiques are different. And the one, I, as I said, that I'm interested in for today is the people want more things critique. Um, okay. So, as I said, I'm going to deal with situations in which the theorist questions whether the researcher who finds irrational judgments is just not looking for enough ends. So the basic case I'm going to deal with, um, it grows out of my own experience um, as a cancer patient. So, um, but I'm going to argue that the, the, the set of choices I'm going to ascribe to myself translate really well to these questions on um, uh, uh, statistical lives and um, identifiable lives and transfer even better to the saving versus preventing illness. So about a year ago I was diagnosed after a monitoring period with a fairly rare form of cancer or retinal melanoma. Um, the disease is much more complicated than I will explain, in significant part because it's much more complicated than I understand. Um, it's got this kind of weird sci-fi treatment. Um, they implant little metal balls in your eyes, and then they send you off not to a medical facility, but to like a warehouse that looks kind of like, for those of you who've ever watched 24, it looks like a warehouse in which the terrorists would be getting a, a suitcase bomb together, or, a, or in which Jack Bauer would be torturing the terrorists. And so, you know, so it's like this big warehouse. It's actually a used proton accelerator. You didn't know there was a market in used protons. So like Lawrence Livermore Lab, when, they, when, their, when their proton accelerator gets dated, they ship it off to UC Davis into a warehouse for physics experiments. And you sit in a little room in the, at the end of, a, of you know, this enormous warehouse, and the little metal balls that they've implanted into your eyes are permit them to make really good 3D pictures out of the tumor. Um, they can locate the tumor more precisely so they don't get these teeny little zapped proton radiations while a group of extremely um, qualified scientists who mostly resemble 15-year-old boys playing a video game, sit in another room and sort of say, move them a little bit to the left, move them a little bit to the right. And, you know, you're sitting there like, they, you know, they'll say something like, you know, move them 1.5 to the left, and the guy in the room will say, okay, 2.5 to the left, and you have you know, things stuffed in your face, and you say, he said 1.5 to the left, what are you doing here? But anyway, so they, they, they do this treatment, and the tr so here's the, the critical moment in the, in the decision-making process. So let's assume this is a little bit counterfactual, but not completely counterfactual. That there's a single follow-up visit. Actually, there are more, but the odds keep decreasing. The single follow-up visit, the odds that you're going to be told that the treatment worked are really, really good. But it also means that the odds that the treatment didn't work exist. So for simplicity's sake, it's about 99 in 100 that it works, about 1 in 100 that it doesn't work. So what I'm going to say is I would have, before the follow-up visit, gladly exchanged the 1 in 100 chance that it didn't work for 0 chance that it didn't work for taking on a 1 in 50 chance of dying from a 1 in 50 increase in my background global risk of dying suddenly and without warning during the same period that I could have died from the melanoma. Just think about lightning, think about heart attacks and strokes, think about, you know, runaway buses, you know, runaway bunnies, think about, any, you know, whatever. Um, you know, so I think I would have made that trade gladly in the three months in between or the four months in between the, you know, stuck in the warehouse and the follow-up where you mostly learn about, the, you know, whether the treatment worked or not. Um, so if I'm right that I would have made that trade, obviously not clear because like a lot of, you know, introspective, you know, fantasies, you can't make the trade. But if I'm right that I would have made the trade, the question is whether I failed to meet the only rational end that one could attribute to me, which would be the desire to maximize my life expectancy, which I would, wouldn't be doing if I made that trade. And whether I did that because I miscomputed because of cognitive bias and error, 
what the probabilities were, or whether instead or additionally, I rationally desired to dampen the kind of existential anguish of becoming a dying person by getting the diagnosis that my treatment had failed. So that's what I want to address. So start by saying there are a lot of reasons to believe that while I can say I would tra have traded this one in 100 risk of dying for one in 50 risk, that I subjectively processed the one in 150 chance as a higher risk than the one in 50 chance, that I'm making exactly the kinds of errors that Connor and Fursky talk about, that I misperceived the relative probabilities, um, and that it was miscalculation and only miscalculation that makes the irrational trade seems sensible. Now, they're actually, one of the fun things, I've spent the last three years of my life writing a book on, on heuristics, so it's an endless list, so you can actually, you got like a laundry list of, of, of mistakes you can make, but I'm only gonna touch on a few, just because probably to keep you all from like being bored to death, which would be a moral problem. Um, so I'm gonna touch on three possibilities that I got the probabilities wrong, and one possibility that I misevaluated the end states that grow out of heuristics and biases research. Okay, so the first one usually referred to as the availability heuristic. So death from retinal melanoma had become incredibly salient to me. To say I thought about it all the time would be only to really press about the limits of thinking about what the word all means. You know, it's like it was really preoccupying. It was therefore really readily available, or to put it in the sort of standard cognitive psych terms, it was easily retrieved from memory. Um, now, ordinarily, judging the frequency of events by reference to their availability is not just quick and easy, but it's usually accurate. Um, by and large, we typically readily recall things most readily when we've been exposed to them more frequently, and we've typically been exposed to things more frequently when they've occurred more frequently. So making judgments about frequency or probability by availability is a generally worthwhile strategy. But we may substitute availability for more considered multi-cue judgments of frequency even when it's a bad strategy, even when events are available solely, for instance, because they're emotionally salient or well publicized. So the standard canonical instances of this in the literature are, you know, if you survey people and ask them how frequently people die in plane accidents, they think it's really high because all plane accidents are emotionally salient and well publicized. If you ask them how often, how likely you are to die from falling in a bathtub, they give very low estimates, a low Trust me, you should be much more scared of the bathtub than of, of airplanes. Um, but, you know, air, bathtub accidents are infrequent, not salient, they're not very emotionally available. Now, there are a lot of theories about how avail availability works, whether we directly treat availability as a frequency measure or whether when we try to think about frequency, we implicitly sample from what we can retrieve from memory and then treat the sample that we've retrieved from memory as essentially a sample of the, of the underlying universe. But the, actually, the, the, whatever the explanation for it is actually won't matter to my point. It's, from my point now, it's surely possible that um, my actual working subjective sense of the probability of death from retinal melanoma was much higher than what I ostensibly learned it to be. That no matter how much, you know, the doctor could show me the literature that said it was, you know, roughly 100, um, chance of the first treatment not working even lower than that on mortality, that I just didn't, real, I didn't process it that way. Its availability inflated its probability. And so when I say I'm trading this one in 100 chance, one in 50 chance, I'm lying to myself. It's not the way I'm really processing it. Okay, so that's one possibility. Second possibility. Both academic psychologists in the heuristics and biases tradition and um, clinicians making use of what's usually called cognitive behavioral therapy techniques believe that people's cognitive judgments often simply reflect the strength of their emotional reactions to situations. So whether I call this an affect heuristic, that's you know kind of building on Paul Slovak, who's a heuristics and bias researcher, or I call it emotional reasoning, building on 
Burns, who is a cognitive, you know, one of the leaders of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the mechanism is pretty much the same. We treat the intensity of our fears as if they're diagnostic of the actual danger of an event. Um, since we're often afraid when events are objectively scary, we come to think that events must be objectively scary if we're scared enough. Um, even though the reason, you know, we get those flipped. It's rational to be scared when things are objectively scary. It's not always objectively scary when you're um, objectively uh, dangerous when you're scared. And that's true even when fear has a multiplicity of forces, of, of, of sources ranging from focalism, repetition, obsession, um, you know, there, I mean, kind of a whole bunch of, of, of reasons that you may uh, be fearing things. So again, second possibility, I got it wrong because I was engaged, I you know, was subject to the affect heuristic or emotional reasoning and simply overestimated the probability of something that I ostensibly thought had a low probability. Third one, um, it's almost certainly the case that the heuristics and biases researchers are right, that we have a tremendous problem comparing um, aggregate probabilities of things that could be aggregated rather than comparing the probabilities of the hyper salient members of groups. So let me give you an example from findings on lotteries. So let's say I give you um, um, 75 lottery tickets and 15 of them are blue and that's the winning color. And then there are seven other colors. Almost all experimental subjects will pick blue, the 15 one, when the other 60 are distributed 12, 11, 10, 8, 8, 8, and 3, and pick, think that blue is a bad thing to pick if it's distributed 39, 5, 5, 4, 4, 2, 2, 1. In other words, where there's one other salient thing that's bigger than the blue one. So people that won't take the bet at certain things, even though there's the same 20% chance. If they added it all up, they sort of say, well, as a group, blue is still a one in five chance, and who cares? Well, all the rest of them are losers. Why, why do I care whether there are a lot of pink losers or only a few pink losers? But that's not the way people bet. Um, again, there are a variety of explanations for why we do this. I'm kind of drawn to the explanation that we first make the easy comparison between the thing we're focused on, you know, do we have the winning ticket, and the most salient alternative, and then we get anchored to the idea that we either have a bad bet or a good bet, and that we don't adequately correct from the anchoring of that first easy judgment. But again, it probably doesn't matter that much for my purposes why we might do that. Um, again, relevance to my case, pretty straightforward. All the losing tickets associated with death from retinal melanoma were of a single sort. They were all blue. Everything else was diffuse. There was nothing, you know, it's like, you know, there's the lightning, there's the, you know, runaway bus, there's the evil bunny, there, you know, whatever. There's all that other stuff, each of which is a low probability event. And so the argument that arises from this is no matter what I say to myself when I say one in 100, one in 50, what I'm really doing is hypersalient, teeny, 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 and I'm actually picking hypersalient over, over teeny, teeny, teeny. It's not a memory thing, it's not an availability thing, it's a, 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 a you know, a kind of lottery comparison thing. So again, perfectly plausible I was miscomputing probabilities across the board. At the same time, it's possible that even if I got the probabilities right, here's another heuristics and biases point, I was irrationally subject to framing effects that made me over, that made my, me evaluate freedom from the risk of my melanoma differently than I evaluated freedom from the risks I would voluntarily choose to take on. So again, here's the, the standard experimental uh, finding that's relevant. Um, subjects are told that there's a disease that has been discovered that will kill 600 persons if untreated. And they're asked to select between two alternative treatment regimens or treatment programs. Most subjects pick a program that will save 200 lives rather than one that will, um, with a one-third chance of saving 600 lives and a two-third chance of saving none. 
At the same time, if you elicit their preferences for a program with identical mortality results, but elicit their preferences by describing it differently, they'll pick a program with a one-third chance that no one will die and a two-thirds chance that 600 will die over a program in which 400 will surely die, although 400 dying is the same as 200 saving. This is asymmetry between things being described as life-saving and life-threatening. Um, if people are indeed risk seekers when it comes to avoiding death and risk avoiders when it comes to being saved, it may well be the case that I constructed myself as being saved from a baseline of already dying from melanoma and was willing to take on new risks of death as long as I was saved from this baseline that I constructed that I was already, you know, I was a goner from the disease. So in some, you know, for those reasons and a bunch of others, because there really are a number of other heuristics that may have led me to misformulate this, I would acknowledge that it's absolutely possible that my intuition that I'd voluntarily choose to lower my life expectancy was just grounded in the sorts of irrationality that, you know, the cognitive science researchers have always highlighted. Um, but at the same time, I want to note at least the possibility that I had an entirely separate end. So in this view, there are just two quite distinct things that I sought to eliminate, and they're not equiprobable in the scenarios I would have chosen to accept in the scenario I was trying to put an end to. So the one that we've already focused on is, of course, death. And the intuition that the trade I claim I would have made is Irrational is grounded in the idea that I'm accepting a higher chance of um, undesired death rather than a lower chance. But there is an entirely separate and conceivably more significant harm that I might have been trying to avert um, by engaging in this kind of imaginary trade. And that is the focused awareness that I had tipped over into the world of persons who were dying. Okay, so let me say that to make this point, um, that death and dying are different negative experiences, I needn't believe or I needn't convince you of a perfectly defensible position, dates back to Epicurus, so it has a long life, um, that at least for secular people, death is neither bad nor good in welfarist terms at all. Um, fundamentally, in Epicurus and, and, and his successes say this, because Unlike dying, no one ever experiences death. You either don't experience it because you're alive, or you don't experience it because you're dead, leaving kind of nothing there for anyone to experience. Now, you should note the quite disquieting implication of this view, among others, is that killing causes no harm to anyone but grieving survivors. It's an odd implication of the view that death itself is not a harm. So I'm not really going to try to convince you that death is or isn't a harm. Just want to note some things about it. Okay, the view of death that, um, that death is not a harm is both kind of powerful, given this idea that no one ever experiences it, and kind of powerfully paradoxical, at least for those of us whose intuitions have been framed to a significant degree by preference utilitarianism. So like when the hold-up man comes up to you and says, your money or your life, and most of you have the good sense to like hand over the money, we sort of say, okay, you've demonstrated by your preference that your life is worth more to you than money, and we know that taking your money is a harm, so taking your life must be a worse harm, at least in terms of your preferences. And so that may be an answer. The problem with that as an answer is that the paradox isn't so readily in resolved even for pure preference utilitarians because you could always argue that the manifest, the express preference for life over money, over whatever else, you know, the, the choice is, is either imprudent or underinformed, and that preference utilitarians should account only for prudent and informed preferences, but that this one's prudent or underinformed, unless it's indeed true that in some hedonic utilitarian sense, not a preference utilitarian sense, not just what you want, but in some experiential sense, it's indeed true that um, good or even bad experiences are, are hedonically preferable to no experience. It's a tough claim to get your head around, but you know, maybe that's right, maybe it's not. Or to say in some kind of objective goods, perfectionist utilitarian sense, that um, 
we can compare not only those with greater and lesser capacities, you know, in the sort of Martha Nussbaum or Sen sense of the having capacities, but we can compare having capacities at all with having no capacities. Again, difficult thing to get your head around. But if preferences are merely, and this is a hard issue, bigger than we're going to get into today, if preferences are merely our best predictors of hedonic states, um, they're of little moment if they're just bad predictors. So we can't really get around the question of whether death is a harm simply by saying we'd all prefer not to die in lots and lots of situations. Because if we're just making, you know, if all the reason that we respect preferences are they're our best guess about what's going to happen in the future and we're just wrong about what's going to happen in the future, maybe not such a, an important preference. But um, however one resolves this thorny, centuries-old question, of whether death is a harm at all. All I need to argue is that the intensified dread of death if that I would have experienced if the follow-up visit had been bad instead of good is simply different. I don't have to argue that there's you know, nothing to death um, and only something to dying. I just have to argue that they're different. So it may be the case that this dread or existential dread is itself imprudent unless death is itself a bad outcome. But that's not nearly as obviously the case. It doesn't, you know, you can't make the sort of quick and ready argument that, um, you can't make the argument no one will experience death. You can't make the argument that you're not going to experience the dread of death in the same way. That, that is an experience you'll, you'll actually have. So the person who dreads knowing she's dying may dread the life that she will lead and plainly experience once she knows that. She may prudently dread a period of time in which long-term planning seems pointless or ironic. She may dread the inability to think that days hold the possibility of significant surprises for her, that there won't be anything salient, either good or bad, that happens, that will all be dominated by what the hell I'm dying anyway, you know, everything will be blunted next to the, to the knowledge of death. Um, <coughs> she may dread the discomfort of those around her who know that she's dying and are uncomfortable with her, may above all, in ways I'll come back to a little bit, dread the loss of what may be a fantasy that most of us can maintain during most of our lives that we're actually immortal. And I want to, I'm going to come back to the immortality fantasy, not as a cognitive error, but as, as something else. Um, they may also, she may also dread dying because um, once she knows she's dying, there's this omnipresent feeling that this huge event in one's life is beyond one's imagination, and that is nothingness. Um, that, the, it, that she will be living with the inability to get her head around the most important thing that she's facing on a daily basis. So again, think about, I, I had cognitive behavioral therapists for all, like throw in some existential therapists now. So existential therapists spend a lot of time with their death-dreading patients, trying to get them to say, you've already been through this nothingness stuff. You weren't born for a really long time, like billions of years. Like you, you've already you've already been through this. Like before, in my case, 1951. You know, it's like there's a lot of time before then. You you know you were there. It wasn't so bad, right? And it's like okay. So existential psychiatrists <laughs> think that you can get your head around the nothingness issue, but that's actually a complicated question. Um, Freud, quite famously, among others, sort of writes a lot about the fact that it's actually impossible for people to understand or get their head around the, the concept of nothingness at all. And it may be that the dread of dying, rather than the dread of death, is the dread of the experience of finding the main event in your life so thoroughly confusing, so thoroughly impossible to process. Now, I don't mean to downplay the possibility that there are positive hedonic states associated with dying and that are actually uniquely available to people who know they're dying. Um, 
ranging from the kind of deep and profound, they may make more sense out of their lives, they may reconcile and accept a lot of things that they hadn't been reconciled to or accepted, to the relatively shallow things, people are nicer to you in some ways, they pretend to think highly of you. So there, there may be a lot of good things associated with, you know, you get a watch, a little gold watch, but even, you know, sort of setting aside the good, you could still believe that even though there may be, you know, these positive experiences, that on balance, the negative ones outweigh the positive ones. Okay, so let me also, I'm going to try to get at this existential issue of dying in a completely separate way, um, too, by reflecting on the standard paradoxes that John Broom raised a long time ago in talking about how we value lives for public policy purposes, you know, how we do cost-benefit analysis of programs that have to kill people. Okay, so broom the standard paradox. So generally, okay, so what, what's the standard method? So economists and cost-benefit analysis analysts typically value lives with complications that aren't really important to what we need to do today. Um, by taking the inverse of the shadow price that is placed on the ex-ante risk of death. So if we'll pay only X dollars more for a product that reduces the risk of death by one in a hundred, or demand only a Y dollar wage premium to tolerate an increased risk of death of one in a hundred, then the value of life is 100X or 100Y. We just take the inverse of what we're willing to pay for the, for the risk reduction. Um, and if not dying were anything like winning a hard to value non-cash prize in a lottery, this would have to be the perfectly reasonable way of valuing dying. I mean, that's how we would value how much you would, you know, instead of winning the lottery with cash, you win the lottery and they give you like a little doll or, you know, uh, you know a watch or something like that. How, how we would figure out the value you put on the little doll or the little watch would be by taking the inverse of the chances of winning it with correct for risk proclivity. Um, Broom noted that this method seemed paradoxical, since if we knew we were about to die when we were poised to avert it, we'd pay much more than 100x to stop the death. And Broom's narrow argument in terms of public cost-benefit analysis was that um, the acceptability of public projects using either using the ex-ante method, the inverse of risk method, was held hostage to completely random exigent facts that couldn't possibly have anything to do with the desirability of the project. And that is, if the accident of non-identifiability of victims or limited information. So, you know, the real version of the paradox is to say, does the project become, go from acceptable um, to unacceptable when in the time between the initial planning period when it finally gets, you know, checked off, we figure out exactly which people are going to die when we, before we just knew it was some subset of them. He said, well, that can't be. This is, you know, it seems paradoxical. But his more profound point was that all estimates of the value of life based on risk preferences have to be inadequately informed. Because in a world in which we were smarter and had more determinative information, we would always identify the people who would die from projects that we now describe as merely risky. Risk is just a function of scientific ignorance. That's all it is. It, you know, and it can't be that our moral structure is grounded entirely in our current level of ignorance. It's that, that's the paradox from his point of view. So in his view, either the ex post measures were the apt ones or we needed to rethink the um, issue of how to value a life. So I think there are two points worth mentioning here in reaction to that. And the second one is more closely tied to the effort I've been making to discuss this kind of existential view of death in public policy. The first point, though, is that I think we should more carefully consider the possibility that neither the ex-ante risk averting, nor the ex-post saving perspective are the only perspectives to take on how to value a life. I think there's actually a preferable perspective and its problem is that it's completely non-realizable in the policy world. There's no way of getting at this. But that our, theoretically what we should be measuring when we're trying to value a life is 
if we're doing it in economic terms, is taking a whole life utility maximizing perspective. We have people trade off additional lifetime consumption and additional bequests for a certain rather than expected increase in life years. And that's how much value they place on life years. You know, people don't really want to live longer if they can't leave bequests. And they don't really want to live longer if they live, you know, if some people, I'll give an example, it's true for some people, if they eat a diet that's incredibly bland and, you know, and spartan, they actually would rather consume more and die earlier. And um, so, in this view, neither the conventional ex ante nor the conventional ex post views have much to do with the value of life. Judgments about risk acceptance don't so much, they do the partly, but they don't so much measure the value of living as they measure the value of modest reductions in death anxiety. So they're actually kind of skewed to what we think we should be measuring. Um, and ex post judgments are basically merely attempts to have one's cake and eat it too, to undo choices to consume more or live a more exciting, risky life that may indeed have been perfectly acceptable once it is that you already got the benefits from it and want to take it back. So I actually think neither the ex post nor the ex ante perspective on this have or actually have much to do with the value of, of, of lives. But here's the second related, the point that's more related to the existential point. Um, for most of us, most of the time, the risk of death is ubiquitous. And we're able to function and avoid despair by backgrounding that. Um, at most times, our futures are indefinite. A shift within the domain of indefinite <coughs> risk simply does not alter the sense that life will stretch out indefinitely, that our life decisions are still mostly what matters, that we should care about planning, care about the future, care about the things that are trivial, feel the invulnerability of having an open-ended future. Um, the sense um, in the ex-ante risk perspective it's totally plausible to me that most of us, in some sense, truly believe we're immortal. Not in a cognitive sense, but that we have only experienced consciousness in a sense of the self and simply can't imagine what it would mean for consciousness and the loss of the self to end. The ex post perspective kicks in only when we've shifted out of that existential frame. Um, we would do nearly anything for life chances to appear meaningly indefinite again. It's this move from indefiniteness to definiteness that's the real shift. Okay, so if that's right, here I'm going to loop back to the implications. So if that's right, there are a whole range of private and public decisions that seem to increase the risk of death at any point in normal time. In other words, where you're still not, you know, you're still, it's still a low risk. You still have this feeling of indefiniteness. But um, try to eliminate or dampen the experience of having to shift existential frames. Um, so I'll start by having you all play, you know, an introspective game. I'm going to ask you in your own mind to think through the following set of preferences. I find them all totally in I find them all totally comprehensible preferences, though every one of them is life expectancy or diminishing next to the other ones. And then I'm going to come back to the public policy ones. So here are the private ones. Would you prefer an 85-year life expectancy with a risk of death at any point in your life or an 83-year life expectancy with 77 years certain and uncertainty thereafter? Okay, unless you think that this is merely about the reduction of mortality anxiety from our normal existential state of indefiniteness to an unimaginably superior one, which is literally no anxiety, think about whether you would, like me, pick the 83-year life expectancy with 77 years of certain life over an 84-year life expectancy where you knew you were going to die on a particular day during your 84th year. 
So that's not anxiety. That's actually, this is indefiniteness versus definite. So my claim is, you know, those were all the 83 versus 85, the 83 versus 84. They're all life expectancy lowering decisions, and they're all having to do with trying to preserve and create a particular existential frame towards diet. Okay, so now back to the public policy issues. It seems to me plausible that the seemingly excessive investment in life-saving cures rather than prevention is in significant part an effort to reduce the number of occasions in which diagnosis switches people into a state of thorough existential dread or at least delays existential dread to the point in the development of a disease in which the disease has also created a high level of morbidity and pain that makes the existential dread secondary or capable of being traded off with physical pain and suffering. So basically one way of putting this is the idea is we're spending too much money to, on cancer cures rather than cancer prevention because we're trying to tell people when you get cancer you shouldn't go into the your, 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 you know, your dead mode. Um, and that that's not a crazy thing to do, even if more people die from it. And that, again, by the time you go into the I'm dead mode, you're uh, in a position where it's being traded off against other kinds of morbidity. So I'm claiming um, may not be the right call, but not an irrational call. And that's the saving versus the, the curing versus preventing. Um, and maybe we pour so many resources into saving those, you know, the trapped in the mind kind of people because there's almost nothing that any of us can imagine more dreadful than the acute awareness of imminent preventable death unaccompanied by other forms of suffering or morbidity. Um, you know, where it's not being traded off for anything. You're just facing in the harshest form the, the you know, short time irreversibility on the way to death. Now, okay, now to be more provocative or perverse about it, um, can we explain our desire to cure rather than prevent, but think we don't do enough basically to funnel death towards accidents, strokes, and heart attacks? That's the, 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 the perverse policy implication. So maybe the paradox is um, of underspending on prevention. It's a paradox on underspending on prevention rather than care, not that we spend too much on preventing, um, that we spend too little on preventing death, but that we can't ever hope to raise cure rates enough to make it rational to spend less on preventing the development of what will still be incurable diseases, but that if you could imagine doing that, it might not be irrational at all, that, that public policy ought to be death funneling as much as it is death reducing. Okay, so that's that side. So I wanted to finish with a, a brief note on um, whether our subjects are um, consequentialists at all, whether they are consequentialists with a richer uh, utility function or just not consequentialists. Um, the psychologists who first wrote about identifiable victim effects, most prominently George Lowenstein, <coughs> treated the phenomenon largely as resulting from a simple cognitive error assessing the efficacy of distinct life-saving measures. Again, not surprising. It, it, this is a literature that grew out of, you know, people who studied biases. But his, his core one, he could have used any of the three I used before, but let me give you the one that he, he mostly explored. So the core of the argument went, people think they've done a better job reducing mortality when they save a higher proportion of a reference group they've constructed at risk um, so when they engage in statistical life saving, you know, spend X dollars to save statistical life, they may save 50 of 5 million vulnerable people. A pretty high number, but a low proportion of the people they've constructed as vulnerable. When they save the trapped little girl in the mine, they save 100%, one of the one people that they construct as risk, at risk. They, so the error that he thought they are making is um, by reasoning in terms of the proportion of lives saved rather than the absolute number saved per dollar invested, they reach a cognitively deficient result. And that, for the first five years that Lowenstein wrote about identifiable lives, that was his dominant explanation. 
So as he kept doing experiments, the explanation proved in certain refined experiments to be um, helpful, partly right, but significantly inadequate. And how did he figure that out? So even when you specify a reference group of people in jeopardy, and the proportion of people to be saved is the same in identified and unidentified groups. So you have the, you know, you, you get the same um, denominator and the same numerator in, the, in groups that are identified and unidentified. Experimental subjects still find saving the identified people preferable to saving the unidentified people. So standard version of it is, that, you know, so this involves not just abstract experimental responses, but uh, charitable giving. So if you have a program and the, all, you describe a group of people who may be eligible for the program that you're asking the subject to give money to. And same number of people in, at the at-risk groups in each situation, um, and you're going to save the same number. Not, it's not saving from death, but saving from whatever the problem is. So the, in the particular experiment involved, uh, Habitat for Humanity, um, a house building issue. And the number of at-risk people in terms of the population that was going to be served by this particular um, branch of Habitat for Humanity was the same in both cases. And the number of homes that would be built was the same in both cases. The numerator and denominator are the same. All that was said to identify say that one group was identified and the other group wasn't, was the thinnest version of identifiability you can imagine. We didn't name the people, we didn't tell a touching story about them, we didn't send the picture, all the things that charities typically do to up the level of identifiability. All that was said is in the identifiability prompt, the people who will receive this money have already been selected. That's it. And in the other group, it said they will be selected. That's thin identifiability, okay? That's as thin as it gets. Radical distinctions in the amount of money given to the two programs. So it's really the thin version of, of identifiability. All you do is you know there is another person already out there. There's, there's somebody that you can picture uh, as an embodied person rather than a not yet embodied person. Um, okay. Um, so it seems... Um, that the decisions that these charitable givers are making are, in the terms I was talking about earlier in the talk, they're partial. They, they're not impartial. They express a preference for people with whom one has developed some form of thin relationship over people with whom one's developed no relationship. Um, points worth a lot more attention, and I'm only going to give it a moment's attention because this is, you know, the end. But um, when we speak of the fact that a person's preference, a parent's preference to save his child rather than to save a larger number of strangers is legitimate, when we say that that kind of, when we say in making that point that pure utilitarianism is either too stringent a moral code or that it is defective, we generally expect utilitarians to give two answers to the claims it's too stringent or it's, it's defective. First, we may say that the anti-utilitarians, first we expect utilitarians to say, that the anti-utilitarians are misconstruing the domain of utilitarianism. It's not meant to govern all personal morality. It's merely meant to be a guide to public policy making. It's not meant to say what the parent should do. It's meant to say what the state should do. So it may be right for me to care more about my kids than others, but for the state, it's best to assume that everyone is equally special to someone. Um, you know, that may not be fully true, but making the judgment that that's not true is considerably more complicated and has a, a host of other problems. Okay, so that's one kind of response. You know, the anti-utilitarians in talking about this form of agent relativity have misconstrued the proper domain of utilitarianism. The second kind of answer you expect them to make is that nurturing agent relative partiality has beneficial consequences. That the consequences of demanding that each party acts as an impersonal consequentialist in each of her decisions would be to weaken 
utility promoting institutions like families. So if we tell people don't care any but more for your kids than for anybody else, it's hard to really do all the parenting we want them to do and we don't know what kinds of institutions would substitute for institutions that are grounded in nurturing that high level of partiality and affection. And again, as I said before, that's quite parallel to a series of what are usually referred to as rural utilitarian uh, responses to you know, case by case utilitarianism. Well, so here's the point in, in this regard. One of the most robust findings of the experimental literature on the identifiable victim effect is that it's very fragile. When people are told that other people generally exhibit it, they stop spending more to save identifiable victims rather than statistical lives. But the sad truth is that they do so not by increasing their altruistic outpourings towards statistical lives, but by cutting back on their generosity to identifiable victims. Um, altruistic concern may well depend significantly on identifiability. So we may purchase a certain version of rational consistency, a quality of spending on preventing statistical deaths and saving identifiable lives, only by driving altruistic spending levels towards zero. When we drive both towards zero, they're not different, but they may not be precisely what we want. So the last point, I guess, is to say whether we should try to justify non-consequentialist intuitions solely by reference to their consequences is a really thorny question. Um, I'm going to leave that one for another day. Thank you.